Okay, so you have a sense of the films that they've made. Um, they're all very different from one another, having seen them. Um, they all are looking at history and using history and the past in very different ways, ranging from you know, archival footage to reenactment to everything kind of in between. So as I was watching them, I was thinking about two metaphors, which I'm gonna spring on you all now and see if, um, how you respond to them. Um, so there are two pieces, two ways that these films act. One is kind of through something like archeology, span which is an explicit metaphor in your um, film. Um, the uh, unearthing of the past and trying to contextualize and make sense of it. And the other one is something I thought of a little more like ghost hunting. Um, like looking for traces of ghosts and of uh, things that have existed in the past and how they show up in material culture and also how they show up kind of in the social fabric. Um, so I'm curious how you respond to that and if one of those metaphors occurred to you while you were working um, or if one of them rings true and I'd love to just kind of go down the line and see how you respond to that idea. <laughs> so so, um, <clears throat> so one of the things we try to do with our film is actually tell a nonfiction story and develop a different metaphor for every single scene and every single emotional turn of the film. So there's actually many different languages in our film. Some of it looks like that, some of it actually looks very different than that. Um, but the idea of archeology, span uh, we bring in a real archeologist, we travel to ancient Rome, he kind of appears in a little miniature television inside of a recreation of our grandmother's house and he tells us about archeology. span So that's definitely present. The question of ghosts actually is really interesting as well because there's a woman that we brought in who was a clothing conservator and she came to our grandmother's house to do an autopsy on the couture dresses that our grandmother made in the 1940s and 50s. And she actually talks about the ghost of the wearer and how when you're looking at these garments, you can actually feel like the lipstick, the perfume, the, the sense of that person. She says, the racier the object, the more that person kind of comes into being. So, so that, that, that question of like presence and absence, ghost and archeology span is always kind of present in, in the different scenes you're working with, and certainly with the different experts and professionals who came into the film as well. And, and your grandmother is the central presence, but right. she's passed, so right. she, in a sense, kind of functions as a the ghost, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think ghosts actually, all of these concepts of how we deal with the past, it's very hard to actually try to capture any part of the past, and you can always sort of look around at all these elements, and basically you're always gonna search for some trace. The thing that's interesting, um, in terms of our film, it's, it's dealing with all these objects, but it's also looking at grief and how at certain points in your life you have major events that occur, so birth and coming of age and grief, um, you know, when someone dies. And I feel like a lot of times what it does is it opens you up to perceive something a little differently. You look at the world in a new way, especially at that moment in the weeks that follow. Um, and I think a lot of times it's been described as looking beneath the seat of reason. You know, you're allowing yourself for a moment to be taken out of the context of your daily life, out of sort of the structure and patterns of what you're seeing, and you're literally trying to find something because, I mean, one of the most visceral components for us is we had, we once had a grandma, we had this person who we knew very, very, very well, and then all of a sudden, within a day, you have stuff. And you know what kept occurring to me is I literally had a human which is now transferred, she has transformed into an object. And I think in terms of finding the past and looking for ghosts, you were constantly looking for this transformative moment. Can you see something in something that's completely not meaningful in front of you and can you find an access point to something that's come before. And I think much of our film was trying to find in the world, there are many, many access points for all of us to, to see something you don't traditionally see. And our job, I think, in many ways as filmmakers is to say, how do you possibly bring that to life in a way that the audience can, can understand and go on that path with you? Uh, we actually, as we're making this film, we talked about it um, as a work of media archeology, span so that's actually kind of language that we were using. Um, because, you know, I do a lot of work for other um, filmmakers and I do a lot of archival work and it often is used as illustration or, you know, it's filling in gaps. Um, and to me, archival footage is never neutral. You know, it's paid for by someone. It's shot from a perspective. It, it focuses on, you know, the same way any film does. It focuses on what the, the maker deems important. And so when we pluck that from its context and put it in a different box, we're kind of ignoring um, how, what it was formed by. And so part of the goal in this film was to be very explicit where the footage is coming from at any given point. So in that clip you saw, we shift over to a TV frame and that's what's aired. That's what goes out to the American people. And then we, you know, we came up with a whole cinematic language to kind of make sure you knew what you were looking at, when you were looking at it, 
the film to me is as much about storytelling as anything else and how do narratives get formed and part of that way is through the media. So if you can watch Reagan do something, do it again, it end up on the news, Sam Donaldson critique it, a different network that you know what that network is, fall for it, you can start to see how we end up with a history that you know, where Reagan has this strangely pristine, you know, reputation in some ways. Um, and so that, so yeah, the idea of archaeology, let's look at the material and treat it as material rather than as, you know, this is history with a capital H period, you know. Yeah, I'm no expert on archaeology, but did, is it contained just to like finding the thing and sort of cataloging it and discovering it? And does it maybe, is it, is it like journalism that way, and that it's in the time that it is? You're trying to put it in the context of its own time. Whereas like a ghost is something by necessity out of time. It's like from a long time ago, and you're, you're maybe more like a historian sort of reinterpreting or trying to understand what happened. And I feel like that's kind of how it's interesting how almost all these films, all these films take something out of the time that they were in and then it's in the recontextualization that the meaning comes. I mean, the original discovery is what it is, and even what you were saying is you're, you're reinterpreting in a different context, and that's where it's, it's kind of the most exciting and the most revelatory. Um, the, I, I mean, I don't really believe in ghosts, but they scare the hell out of me, and I think <laughs> there's something really visceral about um, death and, and ancientness and history that, that is what brings films like these to have like a, a mega life or a, a greater than than um, mundane impact. Yeah, I mean, ghosts for me, it's like it's making me think. Like, was his ghost kind of in our edit room? I mean, for me, it was. Uh, I hate ghosts too. I don't even. It's like for me, the film was about his life, so it was a contem contemporary archaeological dig where we saw hope mm -hmm. in the faces of like, you know, just their Tony Danza, and then you see, uh, who's the guy who played the Fonz, you know, it's kind of like this moment where all these people who became part of our culture were starting out, and um, it's, it's beautiful to me. Um, I'm so inspired by all these films and the use of archive is just, it just makes me want to run home and like <laughs> lay out all my parents' things and photograph them. But um, archive is just, there's nothing better. There's nothing better than finding it and, and, and trying to shape a story um, with an open heart. But the, the ghosts, ghosts are also like what you, what we cling to, right? And that's what, I mean, the object in, in the bird footage is, it, you know, from, from Two Towns Jasper is, it's so uh, haunting and visceral. And to think about the, the thing that you're laying out in your, in your film, that those, the objects that we, and that's so much more about us. And I think like, that the reason why, I think there is a real strong, really, one of the things we wanted to do in our film was, um, you see people before they speak, and there's a silence before they speak. To me, that's like ghosts fill that frame. And there's something, and there's something, there's a relationship between documentary and ghosts, actually. Um, because, because documentary is something that is, you know, you, you watch it as if it's happening, it's of course in the past. Whereas a film like yours, I, I, I'm just crying watching the clip, just knowing. Have a friendly ghost, like in your yeah. film, it's like scary ghosts. Scary ghosts versus <laughs> friendly ghosts. But, but there's, but it, but documentaries show us more about what we cling to. Sometimes They're, it's not, it's not always what you, not what you're showing. It's just as much what, what you are conjuring as an audience. And the, and the ghost is often in uh, in the viewer more than it is even in the objects themselves. And that's also something that film does is capture things that are fleeting. I mean, that's you know sort of obvious. But that to me, it's every everything that's captured, you know, all of those people will be dead at some point. Like, the, any piece of film you look at, the longer the time span is, you know, the more you're looking at, you are looking at ghosts because people aren't alive, animals aren't alive. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot about just capturing things so they're captured, there's a record so that we don't lose them. That was something one of our interviewees said, um, he's the director of the Rockefeller Archives, and we go there and talk to him, and obviously his whole job is to, record their family's story. Um, but one thing he just says very simply is that 
objects prove that someone existed. You know, and I think that can go for film footage as an object just as much as any other object. I mean, basically, dealing with the past is the continuum of making a documentary film. You're always looking at that back and forth, and you're trying to place yourself in relationship to that time. So in many ways, I feel like as you're building out these films, you are seeing timelines just unfold, and then you're trying to figure out the chronology of your actual film within that time frame, along with the archival or footage or, or objects that you're dealing with, as well as the histories and stories that you're dealing with. So I feel like there's these multiple markers of time that you have to interact with and get to line up both on the story side but also to understand how to process them. Yeah, I, mean, I think actually another way to think about it, another way to think about ghosts is also the idea of uh, making the invisible visible and it seems like that's a problem that everyone here is grappling with because most of the subjects in our films are dead, <laughs> you, know, and, you know, whether it be a chain or whether it be a piece of archival footage or whether it be a reenactment, um, there's something that's invisible and we have to find a form for it. And I think it's actually it's really exciting to see all the different approaches because each person is grappling with that problem in a different way and trying to kind of like rest from this like weird like non-existence some sort of existence that can talk about the past. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you went there because um, I think this ties into something Sierra said, which is about sort of who creates what is allowed to be called memory in the future and what is omitted and what is suppressed and what exists. Um, and I'm wondering how, as filmmakers, how do you go about finding those places um, where perhaps something has been suppressed um, or lost and maybe recreating it or bringing it in? What kind, I guess, what kind of a um, responsibility do you feel to the past, uh, to what really happened uh, versus maybe what has been officially allowed to have happened? In relation to what you just said, I mean, you, um, I have a great moment in my film, it's not archive, but it's Robin Williams' first wife, and she's talking about when she first met him and when they shared a kiss. And she literally goes, hmm. And it's kind of like, you, you go to each person to try to find their truth, and you know, we, I don't know, in that moment we went to, he drove, she drove him home and they drove over the, the San Francisco, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's kind of like you try to create, you try to recreate someone's emotional memory with whatever tools you can. Like, it would be cheesy to go to a photograph of them at that point, so we kind of had this beautiful shot of the Golden Gate Bridge at night that we found, and kind of like her emotion coupled with that. I don't know, you, you feel, I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's like you're, you go to people to, for their truths and, and you supplement it in whichever way you can with music, with archive, with um, images. And when you say their truths, it's, like, it's almost like you mean the way they interpret the past. Right. right? So it's like, it's, it's, and, and our film's all about the way people today are interpreting the past. Because the truth is, is the, the, the story of the deportation, if it's, incredibly complex because Bisbee as a town, I mean, on first, I mean, there are people who, you know, find, rightly find parallels with the Holocaust. There's also people who say Bisbee wouldn't have existed without the mining company. And the mining company, in fact, was paying people the higher, wa higher wages than anywhere in the, in the country and perhaps the world. And that's why immigrants were coming into Bisbee. And, and when you're in Bisbee today, there's a sign that's, like, or basically there's like the, the brief history of Bisbee. It was founded in 18 whatever, a bunch of immigrants came, mines closed, and now it's this quirky place. And it's like, they even advertise that the immigrants came to town. And so this, that's another version of the story. And for us, you know, to lay out the, the complexity, the best way to do that is through the people today and through people's interpretation. We have people saying, I don't even look like the character I'm playing, you know? And, and why does that matter? Well, that matters because, because there's a disconnect and there's a working through. And it's not about, it, it's like, I really, really, really dislike most, um, you know, uh, recreations in documentary because they're, because what they do is they try to, they, 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 they work in an escapist, you know, mode and they try to dramatize real people's lives. And it can be really disturbing and disgusting. You know, like I think, for example, the Jinx has the worst uh, reenactments because there's real people being murdered and thrown out of a window. And the way it turns that into like this, this like, I don't know, thing that I just can't stand. So, um, so we- how, how do you really feel? Yeah. Um, 
I, on the other hand, loved it. So (laughs) it all depends who you're talking to. Yeah, definitely. I admired it. I don't know how to do that. And and I think recreation should be called original photography. Or something. Something, because recreations are horrible. Yeah, they well, and and so with ours, it's it's they're more like we're we're the people of today are intervening, and so the, the you know them by the time you see them start to do the recreations, you understand who these people are, and it's exactly what what Sierra was saying about the ownership of the images. We want we want you know we're collaborating with locals to create those images, and so that so when you're talking about strategies of how we actually do it, for me, it's it's all about people today. It's all about understanding people today. And, and through that, you can start to dredge things up. There's something, something I really admired about your film is something I was thinking about making, while making Reagan, and I'm thinking about even more now, which is you know, something like Bisbee, which the point of the film, in a way, is this isn't, no one has talked about this, and we've not heard about it, and we need to make this a cinematic experience, and you, know, you have all the ways that you're doing that. But the reason that, one of the reasons it's not been heard about is there's not media that was captured of that. And all, like, of course there's not going to be media captured of that who, you know, the, uh, the ugliest incidents in our history are not often recorded for very specific, you know, oftentimes for specific reasons. And so that's something I was thinking about with Reagan is, you know, while going through that archive, the, the way we built the film is by watching a thousand hours of all the footage that Reagan shot with the idea that we wanted to talk about acting, but not with an idea of the storyline. And what struck me as much as what was in that archive is what was not in that archive. And so, you know, a thousand hours later, there's one mention of AIDS. And of, of course, right? You know, Reagan's not, he doesn't care about it, so he's not documenting it. Um, and so how do, you, how do you construct narratives of the past that are pointing towards those absence? Because those, are, to me, they're, you know, it's not universally so, but they're often very political. Um, and when we, you know, I worked for PBS History Series for a very long time. Um, and you know, you would do research and you'd read something and, and then you'd be like, oh, that, that person didn't have a diary, I guess we can't, we can't tell that story. Mm-hmm. And so by removing those, not, not retelling those, we're actually perpetuating the narrative that we already have, which is oftentimes paid for, yeah. you know, reflects power structures that already exist. And so, you know, I don't know that I totally nailed it in the Reagan show, to be honest, but it was, how do you point towards an absence is something yeah. that I've been thinking about a lot. Okay, well, I, <laughs> I mean, that brings me to a question, I think, about the future or the present, I don't know, but so you've made films which theoretically 50 years in the future could be dug up and used um, in future documentaries, so that's exciting, um, to it's illustrate terrifying. something, right? So, but that Why actually, did you say that? <laughs> the terrifying part of it is kind of what I want to get at, which is that somebody in you kind of hope that person in the future will feel some kind of responsibility to your work, um, to use it in a way that works the way you hoped it did, maybe. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you're just totally open to whatever, how, however it goes. But how do you think about that when you're dealing with the past? So that's kind of part of this. The other part of it is, it feels to me like there's just more of stuff, because um, everybody is recording video all the time. Um, it's everywhere, there's just going to be a lot of stuff out there for people to use that hopefully, perhaps, will have um, more perspectives and less official perspectives. Um, fewer, or, uh, fewer like accepted narratives about what's going on. So how do you think about that? What challenges do you think um, maybe young filmmakers will be facing in the future? Um, and ha- what kind of responsibilities would you hope people might have to what is being created today? You know, I, I, images are fragmenting our reality in a weird way. It's it like I, we don't experience without reality without images anymore, and this is something that's been escalating through the 20th century to this point. And I, I don't know how you guys feel. I feel terrible about adding images to the world sometimes. I really do because I think it's like, like what what is the point? And 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 I I teach at the University of Missouri, and I try to get my students to understand like you don't like you have to to make an image in 2018. You have to have a reason to do it. You're gonna make tons of images, you know, just for fun, just to make yourself feel better or make yourself, make your friends feel bad or whatever you wanna do. Um, but like to, do, to try to make something, you have to have a reason. And you have to think about who you are, what's the human making it, who are the people that you're recording and why at this point, because there's an image of everything. I mean, and, and so I, I don't, I mean, the, the, 
yeah, I, to, to make films going forward, I just think if they're not doing, if, if they're not doing something that's 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 just like pushing in all these different ways, I just don't know why we make them anymore because there, there's so much noise. I mean, we're day 47 at Sundance. It's like it's. I mean, we've seen so many images, and I've had so many emotions. I'm grateful for those emotions. I can't. Re the fact that I can't remember some of the feelings that I've had. You're a film critic. You know this very well. Like it's very difficult to even remember what you felt about an image anymore. And then, and at that point, we're weakened by images. Actually, we're ac we're actually weakened by the process of creating and consuming so much. And I mean, this is you know, I'm not saying anything radical. I mean, this is like ideas from the '60s, but they're really coming to fruition now in a big way. And so I don't know. Maybe we'll just. I should just. You know, like Nicholas Rogue one time told uh, Martin Scorsese that no, you're not allowed to save um, my film performance because it was made for that year, it was made only for that year, and I don't want people to see it in the future. And I think I want my people to see my films in the future because maybe I have an ego, but maybe all films should burn up and just die and like let, let new people make new images or something. I mean, for, for, for me, I, I think I feel a little bit different about it. And I, I, I see <laughs> Possible. <laughs> I, I'm very happy to hear that. In, 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 in that, like, I, I see us as part of a continuum and kind of what we're talking about about memory and history and archaeology and ghosts. Like, like, we are formed by the ghosts of the people who came before us, you know? In, in our film, I mean, I am formed by my grandmother. And you know, in the film, like, I sort of go through, you know, the two of us go through 20 years of our lives as well and we begin to understand the things that she was telling us when she was 93 years old, things that we did not understand when we were in our 20s, right? And I think like, you know, going back into those pasts, realizing that every new generation is gonna have a different way of understanding things, and that the things that we produce will have a different meaning in the future, um, to me is actually kind of exciting. And it's, it's that we're kind of part of a bigger project. Right? We, we, we are part of a larger continuum of human beings who have always been dealing with material. You know, like, uh, in, in our film, we travel to uh, an, um, a library in, in Rome, and it's from the 17th century. And there's an, a librarian from the 18th century who spent his entire life trying to catalog every single title in the library's collections, hundreds of thousands of books. And he spent about 45 years doing this. He died when he was 84 years old, and when he died, he had reached the letter L. And it's like, you, you hear these stories, and like, this guy like, gave it his all. <laughs> like, he couldn't have done it any better, but he only got as far as he got. You know? And I think in some ways, like, you know. You should just stop using M through C. Just, 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 <laughs> to like, honor it's his memory. It's only like a dozen letters anyway, yeah. it's all good. You know? But, but there's, some, there's something about that, about like, coming to terms with what our limitations are, and realizing that our, like, there's a certain point where we end and the rest of the world begins. And I think like, there's something kind of interesting about that because we, we are trying to narrate stories in a way that is important to us, that, that, that fits with our ethics, with our politics, with our imaginations, but those things will also change. And, and I'm, I'm kind of cool with that. I'm like, but yeah, also, it's like, great that someone else will have that. This, this isn't unique. I mean, the thing is, is like, okay, I know we have YouTube and we have like this crazy amount of stuff now that we all have cameras and we have our iPhones, but like, if you, I mean, again, it's like looking and spending a lot of time in archives as well and like, you know, just with this particular film, but with many films that we worked on with our with our grandmother, you know, we went through an entire house, and like this is one little crappy house in New Jersey. I mean, and like if you look at like we started archiving all the letters we found and all the things, and like there are, I mean, there's so much shit in this place, you know, and it's this, and this is one this is one family, this is one life, you know, or maybe it's a few lives of the people who live there. But when you're thinking about the amount of stuff, the amount of letters and paperwork, and I mean, it's not YouTube, don't get me wrong, but like. It's kind of not not YouTube because it's totally overwhelming. You'll never get through all of it. At a certain point, you're gonna, you know, YouTube. You're gonna turn it off and like go make dinner. You know, for for us, it's like you're gonna be like, okay, enough. Like we gotta finish the movie. You know, so at a certain point, like each era has its technology. Each era has its overwhelming quality of like there's too much of this and there's too much of that. And it's like it depends on how much you're gonna dive into it and how much you wanna reflect on what this says about you. You can also just throw it all out and be like, I don't care, I'm gonna go outside, you know? Or you say, I'm gonna spend my life trying to understand, you know, like there's a balance. You have to find your ethical relationship to it. You have to find how much you wanna interact with that. And I think for many of us, that's actually our lives, you know, our life's work of trying to figure out how to put yourself in that position to deal with the overwhelming quality of it while also trying to filter out something just to be able to tell a story. If you don't start limiting it somehow, like there's no way to get through this process. So I feel like you kind of have to like keep flipping back and forth and being like, oh my God, there's too much stuff to like, I can find a story and I can find a piece of humanity in this. So I guess, uh, not to be provocative, but I personally <laughs> am like t a little tired of stories because I think particularly what's happening now is that 
you know, there's this way of looking at the past, media that's created in the past, only putting it through this lens. And I think it's actually worse in film than it is. Art history has like a long, deep sense of scholarship where film history, people are like, I saw, there's misogyny in that film from 1970s, it's problematic, let's ban it. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're not doing a great job of, you know, we're creating all this media and we're archiving it, but we're, we're kind of failing to retain any sense of history about the context, and I feel like I'm a broken record on that, but like the context things were produced in, and you know, using them as, as a record of a time. And, and so there, I do have some anxiety about like the overwhelming amount of images and the way that they can be reappropriated in other media without, um, you know, and there's a difference. Like I love the films of Adam Curtis, which he does not care at all where things come from. He does not care if it belongs there, if he stole it from a movie, if it's, you know, there from a, 50 years ago, or it's, he does not care. And the wildness of that, I think, is like one approach that is fine by me, but using selectively material from another era and trying to tell a story that's your story, I think, you know, I think we're kind of going astray in a way, personally. I think there's a, a loss of um, specificity. Sorry. No, no, I don't, I, no more stories. No more stories. I, I like that. The story is in you, no more. The story is in you. The story lives Keep it in you. The story lives only in you. Yeah, yeah I, that, makes me, that, that makes me try to imagine a world where we don't have a past either. Or like, we don't know our future, right? And if, if it were the same and we didn't really know our past, I think my gut reaction is, oh, that would be terrible. How would we learn? How would we, you know, how would we interpret what we know today? You know, history repeats itself, we could learn from that, but also history constrains us on some level too, into a world that, that is the way things were. I think a lot of people's political imaginations could be broader without the history that's, that's come before. So yeah, I, I guess now I'm thinking like, oh, there's, there's, there's a curse that comes from the past as well that, uh, you know, maybe we should all leave it behind. Actually, the next movie I'm working on is kind of about the future, in a way, and so that's, like, yeah, I know, I, I'm gonna think about this as, as to how to turn that backwards somehow. But, but I think often, though, to touch on both of your points, whether it be historical stories or whether it be contemporary stories, we tend to tell stories the same way. And I think if we kind of come back to, I think one of the reasons that we're all sitting here is because, like, we all are taking different approaches to the ways that we tell stories, the ways that we put images and people and, and their stories out there. And like, when I think about history, I'm often very frustrated by history because people are like, oh, this is what happened. They're like, well, that's part of what happened. <laughs> but what about if you think about this, 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 then like the picture becomes very much more complex. And like, you know, I even see, I look at YouTube or the news or all this like proliferation of images. People tend to do things the same way. People tend to smile in pictures, right? Like there's all these things that we're all sort of telling the same story the same way, you know, and, and, and then they repeat themselves, whether they're like repeated a few times or like many millions and billions of times. So I think a lot of it is also like looking at different ways to mine the history and also mine our own attitudes to not be so sort of two dimensional. Yeah, the idea of people telling stories the same way is literally my film. Like, you know, like they, um, I mean, part of the deportation was a, a set of performative stories. You know, uh, the, the IWW are anti American. Um, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, they're going to do that. Some of that was based on reality, most of it was fake, um, literally fake news, and they, and that story was used as propaganda to activate this side of the business owners, you know, and these people who didn't want their town destroyed, and so they had their own stories, and it's just stories on stories on stories on stories, and, we, and, and that led to the final story, it's like, I mean, there's no other, Without, I mean, in, there's, a, there's a line in, in our film where um, the, the author of the novel, Bisbee 17, Robert Houston, says, cowboys learn to be cowboys by reading cowboy novels. And it's like the sort of central idea of the movie in a way is that we only know how to even perform these stories because we keep telling the same stories over and over again. And, and I, I, I love what Sears saying about the, the danger in that. I mean, it's like there's, there's because we do the same things. It, and, and so how do you disrupt that? You can disrupt that, you have to point it out, first of all. I mean, there's no real way to, to make an ethical film anymore uh, without pointing out your own work in, within the film. And that can be done in a number of ways. That doesn't mean you have to show cameras on screen. It can be done just with great editing. You know, it can be done, like Joe Beanie did it in Wanted to Desire. I mean, that's exactly what's happening in that film, is pointing out the, the, na the nature of storytelling within that film. You guys like achieve that. So, I mean, um, so I just think that that's, it, it, 
you know, it's, we, we're in the, stories create feedback loops, and, and so the past is always the present, but, and then we're just repeating ourselves again and again. Yeah, and I think something I've been most frustrated by, actually some of the documentaries in this festival, are films that are criticizing the media, criticizing storytelling, while also telling a story without seemingly being aware that they are another camera in the room who is doing the same thing, a different, you know, and that, that sort of lack of self-awareness I find a, a, to be a bit of a problem. And, you know, it, it's what Robert's saying. It's like kind of re-emphasizing that same predetermined story by, by having really, I, no, I, not pointing to the fact that you are constructing another narrative while being critical of the narratives that are constructed, and I think there's a lot of different ways of doing that. And yeah, part of our role on some level that we're trying to take on here is teaching media literacy. And I mean, I think Robert's right that, 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 it's ethic, that it's an ethical imperative to do that at this point, but I do hope for a future when people get it and can look at, and can look at our films that way without us having to cue that as, as much, maybe. That, that would be we have camera person now, so that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, no. We show, stu all students should watch and camera person, yeah. but, and then you can watch movies students. going forward. I, I mean, I think that's the great thing about documentary now, is the, the way it's kind of turned away from being as like subject-oriented and more uh, sort of internal and more of an art, is that it is about media literacy. It's about understanding the kinds of images we make. And the, the more inward turning it, it is, on some level, I feel like the more relevant it is, which is, which is weird. But that's something that's very much fought against. I mean, just in terms of the funding structures of things. I mean, yeah. as much yeah. as, like, don't get me wrong, no. I mean, I couldn't agree more, but, like, funding-wise, that's the opposite but of what you're supposed to say. that's changing. I, I feel like that's... Uh, I mean, the more we all <laughs> are changing about it, it's changing. Nails is an editor, so it's, that's you know... That's true, I have yeah. to <laughs> Which means he's well, a dark room yeah, with yeah, exactly. dark I mean, uh, the amount of times, I mean, all, like, our entire process of raising money for this film was trying to constantly basically say what we weren't doing in order for someone to believe in what we were doing. I mean, so, I mean, I think the thing is, is that as much as we can change stories, you know, ultimately the crux of it is, do you have someone who is known? Do you have a famous person? Do you have someone who is a traditional? I mean, that's where you repeat the same stories. And, and don't get me wrong, there's so many amazing films about all of these people that I love seeing, but like, I mean, for coming at this from an approach where we're trying to actively not work in that space, I mean, that, that was, that took a long time to, to figure out how to get that into the market. And I think that even now, I mean, there's been, you know, we made a personal film, which I have no idea if I'll ever make a personal film again, but like, we made a personal film, and that's considered to be, you only made a personal film. And I think that that's something where, you know, here is this person who is not the traditional heroine, she's a, you know, 83 to 93 year old woman who's telling you about life. From my perspective, I mean, she's literally taking you into like the, the back door of what do you deal with in your personal reality in a family, in a house, which structures all of our society. A house is what structures our society, or where we come from, for better or for worse, is what builds up the network, the structure, our identity, our way of perceiving, our ethics, everything is coming from that space. And you know, for us, that was a huge challenge to get that out into the world, to believe that we can talk about those issues because it's coming from someone who's not known and who shouldn't be on camera. So I mean, I think the thing is, is that we are always dealing with this back and forth of, let's push the form forward, let's get new people in there. But you, it's like we have to fight on that for a lot of levels to shift how those stories are getting told and how fundraising works. and. And also people's belief that you can have a form that actually draws you into it enough where it isn't just personal. I part of that, I think, and I'm just gonna like shout out to Sundance's critics program because there's a language for this and the more people are aware of that language and can speak it and understand it and critics like Alyssa are writing about these things in a large forum, I think the more literate we'll all be. They are flashing cards at me, so I think we <laughs> have to wrap down. But um, this has been a great conversation. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.